to Casually Dressed and Deep in Conversation with me, Greg Chalmers. CDDC is sponsored by Pizza Daddy, Lanarkshire's number one American-style pizza parlour. To stay up to date on new flavours and promotions, then get connected on the socials. The Instagram handle is at RealPizzaDaddy and the website is www.thepizzadaddy.co.uk. To see what we're getting up to here at Casually Dressed, then you can find us on Instagram with the handle at CDDC Podcast and on Twitter. It is at Podcast CDDC. Also, as you're watching this on YouTube, then please hit those like and subscribe buttons. And with me today as a special co-host is professional dancer Michael Scott. How are you doing, guys? I'm good, mate. I am good. Uh, on, on this rainy and unpleasant day, we're talking to mental health expert and the founder of Headstrong, Brian Costello. How are you? I am very well, lads. Very well indeed. And it is very rainy and unpleasant. Uh, can I just say, I, people could be listening to this on a beach, but it is rainy and unpleasant <laughs> here while we are doing this. Is that why you've got a wee palm tree in the background there, Brian? Exactly. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> just to feel all tropical. That, I'm looking for sunshine. Uh, that, that is what it is. Uh, I'm hoping that I get a tan off my light here. <laughs> uh, so, how have you been keeping? Are you well? Uh, yeah, mate. Yeah, been good. Uh, we it's been as you would expect in the world of of mental health. Um, it's been very busy uh, over over lockdown. Um, uh, the last time I spoke to you, uh, it actually been uh, it kind of died off a bit. People didn't really know. I think where they were. There was a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, and this is probably this could be something we end up talking about as we go through. But as soon as the schools went back. Um, then all of a sudden we got like silly busy. Uh, really? And it's, it's been a bit mental um, since the schools went back. We were just teenagers, teenagers, teenagers as all these anxieties reappeared, uh, disappeared a little bit during lockdown. Is there, a, is there a similar thread that runs through all the anxieties or is it all over the place? Uh, with, with young people these days, um, I would reckon about 80% of it is different forms of I'm not good enough. Uh, to be honest, that's not massively different in adults, but it tends to be things like I'm not good enough, but it manifests itself in things like fear of judgment. Um, what are people going to think? You know, What are people saying about me? All of these different things. Sometimes it's about I'm going to fail all my exams, but yeah, it's like... It's, it, 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 I've got to admit, it, it, I, I, I've got this thing that I say that where we, we pretty much only have one problem and then different things come off it. And, and I, I genuinely think you can boil almost everybody's problems down to I'm not good enough. Wow. It just shows I mean. up in different ways. <laughs> so what, what, do you think, what do you think spawns that? Is it just try to compare yourself to what you believe other people are? Yeah, a whole variety of things. Sometimes we get taught it. Uh, as well. So I've got this thing that I talk about, about the recipe for a perfectionist. Um, so if any parents are listening to this, if you want to make yourself a perfectionist, I, I genuinely have this person as a client at the moment. I was telling them this and they were killing themselves laughing because I'm actually dealing with their son. I was speaking to dad about about the, the boy and he's like, oh my God, that's so my dad. And it was that, uh, this guy is a, uh, he's a golfer and the, the dad is a golfer at a relatively high level. And the wee guy, his, his son's coming up and looking like a really, really talented golfer um, as well. And he's like, I'm trying to be dead gentle on him. You know, I don't want to be like my dad. And I, and I was saying about the, the recipe for perfectionist, which is basically, um, dad, mum, I got nine out of 10 on the test. And what did you get wrong? Um, ah, right. You know, like mum, mum, dad, I won silver in the race today. All oh, right, okay, who won? Uh, uh, like what, what stopped you winning like standard. how did you win and if you just chip away at their confidence and their self-esteem by just constantly just asking that's how easy it is and and actually to be honest most parents are doing that thinking they're doing the right thing you know they're being motivational but with, with their own kids you know so that that guy talked about phoning his dad um, and saying you know I'm fourth in the tournament dad I'm fourth in the tournament and his dad turning around going you do know there's three people ahead of you son uh, and stuff like that and you're like brutal, oh. <laughs> exactly brutal <laughs> so it can be it can be ongoing ongoing campaigns uh, if you like like that it can be especially when we're growing up um, mm -hmm. that there's like classic things like uh, friendship fallouts you know just a, a bad friendship fallout at the wrong time classic stuff I'm not mm -hmm. good enough nobody likes me 
you know, you get to 25, 30, 35, 40, and you look back on it and go, God, that was dead silly. You know, I remember that. You know, I was 10 years old and all my friends fell out. But when you were 10 years old, that was massive. That was your world. That was that was everything, you know? So like you've got less responsibilities and less things happening in your life at that time, haven't you? So like these things make such more, much more of an impact to you, don't they? At 100%. Uh, you know, that's why I, when I train therapists, so when I train people in the stuff that I do, uh, people are always like, oh, I'm, I'm really worried about working with teenagers. I'm worried about working with kids. I love working with kids and teenagers because <laughs> their lives are simple. You know, as you say there, Mick, I mean, it's like, what have they got? Friendship, school, family, exams, maybe. That's yeah. about it. By the time you get into like being us complex adults, you know, we've got baggage. Uh, you know, we've yeah. we've got all sorts of shit floating about, you know, that, that we picked up over the years. We've got exes, we've got, depending on what age you are, you might have kids in various places, you know, there's, there's all <laughs> sorts of stuff going on. Uh, you know, you you know, just like you've done, Mick. You know, you've moved house. You're living in a in a different place. You're trying to build a career, so it gets much more complicated. But you're you're absolutely spot on. For yeah. kids, it tends to be quite simple. Um, you you said when you said that it got busy for you when kids started going back to school. Yep. What do you think the correlation between them being at home helped? Obviously, seemed to maybe help them handle these situations that they're having Probably a lot better. Than going to school what do you think that was that kicked that off well it's great i mean i'm so glad you asked that because I, I that would do it's just perfect stuff for me to talk about <laughs> I, I, I talked about this when it was when it was going on um because of the way that so let, let's put it this way so when we when we're dealing with our mental health what we have to understand is that our mental health is contextual which makes me sound super intelligent but basically all i mean by that is is that your mental health will will fire off in different places in different ways. So the easiest way to think about that is if you're somebody who drives a motor, um, you will drive very differently when your mum's in the car than you will do when your mates are in the motor. You know, like that'll be a very different thing. Even notice that I even said your mum's in the car, but your mates are in the (laughs) motor. motor. Uh, You know, even change the stream. Even change what we call it. In the brief. Uh, Exactly. Get in my brief. Uh, Let's go for a wee scoot about, you know. Uh, Absolutely. It's like, uh, so uh, this this is basically what I mean by contextual. So it changes all the time. So if you've got a thing about, for instance, not being good enough, uh, then as soon as school shut, as soon as the school shut and whenever that was, March, you know, time, April time, uh, around the Easter holidays, uh, all of a sudden, most of the things that actually cause you to be scared, although the fear is coming, this is really important for me to say, um, that the uh, mental health is an inside out process, not an outside in process. What I mean by that, when I see the things that caused you to have poor mental health, this is not then the fault of the people in your school. It's all about changing yourself. So it was always there. So almost if you like what happened when the school shut was all that anxiety just lay dormant. It just ah, sat there and all really these okay. parents yeah, yeah. went, oh, look, it's gone. And I said to so many parents, genuinely, I was like, it's not gone. It's hiding. I was like, because the thing that causes it to wake up isn't there. And then what happens is as soon as they go back to school, they're back around friends, they're back in those social circles, they're back in that, that environment, all of a sudden, boom, and back it comes, and all yeah. of a sudden it fires back off. It's the same reason, for instance, as a, for an adult kind of thing, like we can, uh, you can go away on holiday for two weeks when you can go away on holiday, you know, like, so you can go away on holiday for a fortnight and it feels like you've left all your problems behind and you... You know, that's you come back and go, like, ah, honestly, that's us. We're getting on so well now. That's <laughs> us. We've sorted out all our relationship problems and we're going to get on and we're going to talk much more. And it's going to be so much better. We've been so honest with each other. And then you come back and within two weeks, you're like, ah, you're a cow. You're an asshole. <laughs> 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 because all it did was it just disappeared because you were on holiday and the sun was out and you were sitting on a beach not having to deal with work and who's putting washings on and, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And then when that all comes back, so... Yeah, so it's, it's important to, to, so that basically an answer to your question, Mick, is, is that yeah, they were just away from it. So it just, it went quiet. Yeah. And then I think a lot of parents thought, that's it. Look, they're cured. This is brilliant. And then what happened was as soon as they went back to school, it just, so we started to get the phone calls. So uh, fair enough. I would imagine trying to 
re-establish someone's self-worth is a gargantuan task you know and to, to, and i know that you uh you kind of work at things very very quickly i think we'd spoken we'd spoken in the last podcast when you'd said that um people go to therapy for years and years and but the most people come to you for like a, just a handful of sessions absolutely so yep. how, how do you re-establish somebody's kind of self-confidence and self-worth in such a condensed period of time well i think the getting their confidence back is the quick bit getting their self-esteem back is the bit that takes a little bit of time and probably happens after the sessions mm-hmm. what i'm almost doing is um getting them to a point where they've got permission to start building up their self-esteem so I, I, I'm only just working on this metaphor, right? So if this is garbled bullshit, guys, you have to ask me questions, right? right? I'm, I'm strapped in. I'm ready for it. <laughs> you have to get ready for more questions for me. So basically, um, if you imagine that, that confidence is what happens when you spend your self-esteem, right? So what I mean by that is, and uh, this is this is a, an audio medium, but if you could see me just now, I'm holding up like a flask, Okay. Uh, kind of thing like a, a kind of like a thermosy flask for uh, for tea and um if you imagine that basically your self-esteem is like a big tank that's inside you or a, a you know it's, it's, it's basically something you store like a fuel tank mm-hmm. now confidence is what happens when you spend a little bit of that so basically if somebody's got lots of self-esteem they can afford to by the way what's the what's the rules on swearing on your podcast lads uh, fucking swear away man excellent fantastic. <laughs> right, so, uh, okay so basically uh, what happens is if you've got a big tank full of self-esteem and your in your tank is full you're allowed to fuck up and um, because mm-hmm. if i fuck up and i make a mistake and it goes wrong then basically i've got self-esteem in the tank so that'll deplete a little bit it will come down a little bit but i've got so much that i'm still all right Mm -hmm. but what happens is as you get started as your tank starts to get lower and lower and lower and we start to get less and less uh, capable of spending that esteem uh, because we've got so little to spare Mm -hmm. that if somebody comes in and we lose some of it the example i've been using genuinely and, and this could bring up some childhood trauma potentially for all of us I, I don't know it depends on how your school life was but like going up and asking a lassie out when you were still in school or like approaching a girl when you were in school you know like and or approaching a guy in school depending on, on how it was and it's like that thing of the fear of that rejection the fear of that going badly depends on where your self-esteem is so getting the permission to start to fill that tank is about getting people to have permission to start making decisions again. Because what people do when they get low in self-esteem is they stop making decisions. So they start doing stupid shit where they their life can just slowly just move like, almost out of their control. So they end up staying in the shitty relationship. Sometimes they end up even deeper into the shitty relationship where they're like, well, I've been so low in self-esteem, at least this person will have me. Do you want to marry me? And before you know it, they've got two kids and they're married to someone that you could have told them 10 years ago, you know, that they, they, they weren't in love, you know, that, that this mm. relationship was going nowhere. But because of the low self-esteem, they, they can't handle the thought of being able to break that relationship up because <gasps> I've not got any self-esteem to spare. So what we do in in therapy more is get people to a point where they start to realize that it's okay to make decisions that that it's okay to turn around and go this is what i want and it's okay for me to say this is what i want and if you can't give me it then i'm out and that includes your career all of those different things does that make sense Uh, yeah that was really good i like that actually Good, I'm glad, Mick. I'm glad it's Because <laughs> uh, it's, uh, so it's, uh, this is something that I'll genuinely, is, this is a fresh metaphor. Um, so yeah, so it's like basically self-esteem, you need to fill the tank and, and how you do that is by making decisions. And then just to add on to that, just for anybody that's listening, one of the mistakes that people then make is that when they think, right, I'm going to go and get self-esteem is that they make decisions that are too big. Another example of that would be something like um, if you imagine somebody like whose fitness or weight has gone a little bit, you know, over the over maybe the, the lockdown period. <laughs> uh, and what they see is, is that they see something like, right, I'm going to lose three stone. And then what they do is they go to try and lose three stone. Um, but that's quite a big task and can take quite a lot of time, depending on what it is that you're doing. And then what happens is they lose a stone and a half. And this is where people then don't realize that they have to fill their self-esteem tank because what this person then does 
is they wanted to lose three. They've lost a stone and a half before Christmas. And this person is now sitting there going, that's shite. I only lost a stone and a half. I wanted to lose three stone. I'm a piece of shit. So I'm um, check me. I couldn't even mm. lose three stone. And actually mm-hmm. you're like, no, no, no. But you, 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 you lost a stone and a half. Them. That's amazing. But because they make bad decisions and they, and they set their, um, their targets a wee bit wrong, actually by doing well, it still lowers your self-esteem. So it's about focusing on small wins. If you need to build up your self-esteem again, focus on the wee wins, build them up over time, you know, mm. and, and then as you build them up, the more self-esteem you've got, the bigger steps you can take. The bigger steps you take, the more your self-esteem grows, and then it becomes a cycle. Um, and then you can start to spend it. I feel that I can connect to that in a way because um, I, obviously I do a lot of teaching myself um, through obviously uh, dancing and stuff. And the one thing that I'm always trying to get through to new students coming into the industry is um, everybody, everybody will go to dance college and they'll write, I'm going to be a dancer. And then you're like, okay, what do you want to do with that? And they're like, I'm going to dance with Justin Timberlake. Yeah. I'm like, right, well, you do realize there's maybe... 150,000 dancers trying to dance with Justin Timberlake. <laughs> and, and, he's only, six. Uh, and he's only higher than six of them. So yeah. the prospects of that happening for everybody is very exactly. low. And um, don't get me wrong, like aim for that, train for that, try and achieve that, do everything you can to get there. But at the yeah. same time, I'm like, I always say to them, whatever your goals in the industry are, don't put a name on it. Don't say, oh, it's got to be this artist or it's got to be this show or it's got to be this. I'm like, just be happy aiming to get on stage or aiming to go on a tour around the world or aiming to do this or that or this. And then when you achieve it, it will come in its own form. Do you know what I mean? It will come in whatever way that is. And then you can then, you can then appreciate that and be happy with that coming instead of being like, oh, I'm touring the world, but it's not with Justin Timberlake. So yep. I'm shit. I didn't make it. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, it's, uh, so I can t- totally relate to that. I've actually... That's something that I try and get through to my students a lot. But the way you put it with the weight loss thing was really nice. Like, oh, I like, I'd, Mick, without making this a love in me, I love jewels. So I'm just <laughs> making that right. so, I, I, I was speaking to a professional dancer recently. <laughs> this example. Uh, <laughs> prepare to hear that on other podcasts uh, in the future. Uh, and he was saying, you know, you can aim for a big world tour with Beyonce or Justin Timberlake, you know, but, you know, and, and it, but it's absolutely spot on. I mean, like, I, I remember when I first started this, this is a, a name that, that some people might not recognize, but many people will. Like when I started doing all this full time, around about 2007, I started, but this would probably have been about 2008. Uh, I went to see a guy called Tony Robbins down in London, oh, who's a big oh, American yeah, motivational yeah, yeah. coach, you know. Uh, nine fat uh, tall. So, yeah, so I came back from that want to be Scottish Tony Robbins. Uh, that, that's where I wanted to be. And that, that's who I then compared myself to and made myself feel completely shite, you know, because uh, constantly I'm like, I'm not a dog, but Tony would do that and Tony would do this. And he's got 14,000 people in a room and, you know, I've got 15, you know, in a room in Erskine, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and why, am I not there? why am I not at the Excel center? And all I did was make myself feel crap. But I was yeah. comparing myself to someone that's got a machine. Like, I mean, that that industry that he's in, that, that business that he's in is a absolute just machine. He's worked it up over many, many years. He, he, he was there. At the, you know, there's just so many factors. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's... It's so easy to chip away at your self-esteem and that definitely when you're a teenager, but even as an adult. And <clears throat> it is a case of, of giving yourself just a bit of time to start building that back mm. up again. Yeah, yeah. because as a teenager, other teenagers don't have filters, right? <laughs> like, I, like, I remember being at school, people were just brutal. They just say, like, what you're saying, that example of trying to approach a girl, you know for a fact your mates are going to call you out on it. Whereas as an yeah. adult, your friends will be a bit more polite about it. Like maybe your close friends will say a joke about it, but yeah. like anyone else around is going to just ignore it or be polite. So it's just so much easier for your self-esteem to get drained at um, school or high school or whatever it yeah. is. Everybody's battling, you know. It's it, it, the, the, One of the things that happens when they're a teenager, so from about... So from about the age of 14, we would expect about 80% of teenagers to be in a period that we call socialization. And the socialization period is two questions, which is who am I and how do I fit in? So everybody's basically fighting to find out their own identity, uh, as well as to find how they fit into whatever group it is that they want to fit into. And some people, as I always say when I say this, fit in by fitting out. 
So, you know, if we if we remember back, I don't know, you know, back in my day, it would have been the heavy metal guys, you know, that there was only about five of them, but they all had long hair and wore Megadeth t-shirts, you know, and <laughs> uh, and that was kind of like, they weren't maybe into kind of some of the stuff that everybody else was into as hip hop came up, you know, and you have your wee tribe, as I call it. Uh, it can be a, a, a difficult thing to, to stand out because some people will, or to do something different because people will turn around and go, I check you being different. Uh, uh, you because you don't fit in, you now don't fit into your group because you're different from us because right. you do that thing so i mean mick you must have experienced that though growing up because i don't know what age you are but being a being a boy dancer is now relatively common i mean yeah. i think kind of diversity came along and sort of made that cool you know and, and now you get boys want to dance hip-hop and all that but mm. was that were you not an unusual entity when you were growing up therefore yeah being a, a boy definitely dancer? definitely it was well i was at school what 14 years ago yep and it definitely was it wasn't as accepted as, as much i had the uh, i must admit i think i had the advantage of i didn't start dancing until i was about 17 so i was in sixth year at school and um i'd almost i mean obviously not in any way shape or form completely found myself but i was kind of a lot more secure in myself and right. like i'd been through the whole school process and i had my group of friends and it, it was my group of friends all started dancing together so it was like, uh, a, it was a lot easier. Like now that when I, when I started teaching kids and hearing like some of the things they go through and some of the um, alienation that they feel from other yeah. children, like I do think, oh, I didn't actually experience that as hard as maybe some of you are feeling it. But some of the stories I've heard from like colleagues and fellow dancers is like, some people go through it a bit rough. Like, and, it, and it, as you're saying, I think that would apply to anything. As soon as you're not in the norm or, as soon as you're different, kids are just going to be quickly going, oh, you're a weirdo, why are you doing that? Yep. Or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it takes a level of maturity to go, oh, you're just doing something that I've never experienced or I've not been around, like blah, blah, blah. Exactly. But yeah, yeah it's, it is beautiful though now because there was a massive movement actually. Um, it was at the start of lockdown where uh, over in America, they, they started to do boys dance too. And it was okay. because, um, I can't remember what talk show it was on, but one, uh, it was on an t- American TV program. They basically started slating a male dancer and like just doing that old stereotype, like, oh, yeah. you must, it's like not for guys. Guys are meant to be guys, blah, blah, blah. And then this beautiful movement happened. And now the influx of male dancers like coming into schools right. and all that was phenomenal. So it's beautiful to see. It's but, just assume masculinity. Uh, it's a, kind of a an anachronistic view of what being male should be. For ex- mm-hmm. like, because Mick, you grew up in Clydebank, right? You went to school mm-hmm. in Clydebank. Do you know what I mean it's not the easiest place to express yourself? Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, without fear of chastisation. Um, yeah. And I think that uh, you. I mean, and even. <clears throat> What you were saying, Brian, about having like smaller groups. When I was when I was at school, I was like a wee emo guy. So I was hmm. just hanging about Central yep. Station and we had our own <laughs> wee gang and everyone all behaved the same way. So it doesn't really yep. matter what what sort of tribe you fit into, as it were. The, everyone, they all have their wee rituals that kind of set themselves apart from each other to try and fit in, you That's know. Um, and it, it's, uh, on, and I think at school it's h- hilarious because they all have like a look that is like the signature of that group. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like when we were at school, it was if you were a kind of emo punk skatery guy, your backpack used to wear it with two straps and you had it at the lowest possible setting. <laughs> 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 but if you were a, if you were like one of the wee Ned guys, you'd a set of rock ports on and a crew cut. <laughs> uh, and a burgers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but just to, and, uh, and whether you liked it or whether you didn't, it was just so that you felt like you fitted in. Mm. And that's it. It's all about. It. That's why, especially when we're younger, uh, you know, the, the the labels are are so important to us. You know, I went round. So when I I was uh, Mick, in terms of kind of you know you started dancing, you were finding yourself. I I, I think in terms of that fourteen to twenty one, I went into a wee bit late. So I was probably mm. about seventeen. It was basically college before I started really feeling as if I started to find out who I was. School was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Uh, in terms of that identity thing. I was okay in school, but I never mm. quite felt as if I fitted in that that type of thing. But after that, all I ever wanted to do was basically to transmit who I was through what I wore. It was like my identity became so important. So 
Uh, uh, any t-shirt with Happy Monday, Stone Roses, Charlatans, by the way. I'm a wee bit older than these guys for anybody that's listening. Uh, so uh, that would have been to 1990, 1991. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden it became important that it, like, it, genuinely every t-shirt I owned had some sort of slogan or band on it. But look at now I've got an identity. Now I know who I am. Yeah. You know, like wearing one of my favourite t-shirts, which uh, probably says a lot about the, the, the 90s and where I was, was... Uh, Sean Ryder uh, in the Step On video, like now I'm going back. If you, he's dancing on the top of a motel and he's doing his whole thing with Bez in the Step On video. One of my favourite uh, t-shirts was Happy Mondays. It said Happy Mondays Rave On and it was Sean Ryder standing next to the big E and that's all it was, was Sean Ryder uh... like, holding on to the E and it said that Happy Mondays Rave On. That that was like because it was like this is who I am. Look, I'm cool. Uh, yeah, look, I'm cool. Yeah, yeah. And I know what all of this means. Mm. Uh, and I, and I wear it on my chest. And it becomes so important to young people to assert that identity, mm-hmm. and, and and to find all of those people that they fit in with. So that's what I thought as well, Greg. You know, when you're saying about what's now, I don't know if it was in your day, but now it's what's called the called the four corners. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, and those huge groups that, that have skaters and, and emos and kind of the alternative kids that all gather there, it's important at that age to feel, look at, look at how I'm part, but as you guys I'm sure have found, as you get older, that circle you start to realise just yeah, that a load of hangers on and actually it's a yeah. bit too and, it, and your circle mm. starts to shrink back down until you find actually, you know, who you, who you really are. But yes, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that, that period of growing up is is so important to our mental health and and genuinely for many people listening doesn't matter how what age you are Mm. that many of your mental health stuff and this goes back to how we started this way you know where does that not good enough thing start many of the things that will now be affecting you were probably installed in school or uh, as you were a teenager while you were growing up you've just learned to cope with them until they then become a problem so I, i call it assets becoming liabilities so, uh, you know, okay. it's great to be a perfectionist when you're 25 because you're now paying attention to everything. You worked your arse off. Everybody loves you in work because every job you do is perfect. Mm-hmm. Then you're 35 and being a perfectionist has got you promoted a wee bit and now you're fine. But then you get to a stage where you get promoted and being a perfectionist as people turn around going, can you just get this done? Oh, yeah, but it's not quite right. I need to just check it just one more time. You're like, no, don't mm-hmm. check it. Just fucking do it mm. uh, and you're like and you, you're being asked to make and you're like no but i can't do it because that makes me anxious and that thing that helped you all the way through then you know sometimes That's the fear the of not being good enough pushes you to be better all the time it, it's it's about paying attention to those times i don't think we came on here thinking about speaking about the teenage years but it is so mm-hmm. important it's like the foundation that your mental health built on if your teenage years were good mm. you're probably good if they were a bit rocky which most of us are as we're talking about then maybe not so much so, I think um, what you, uh, if I'm right in saying, I'm still, I'm still new to the concept of what it is you do, Brian, but what I, uh, I was watching the previous, well, not watching, listening to the previous podcast that you done with Greg, and yeah, you were, yeah. you were uh, defining what you do is more of understanding how the brain works and how the mind yes. works in the sense of, so instead of focusing on the problem, you're focusing on how that became about. Is that right? Like how, like, yeah. Yep. Um, and do you not think like, you're saying you love working with kids. Do you not think that comes from the fact that if we all knew that at a younger age, like if you start teaching these kids, by the way, this is what's going on, then these problems that you're talking about might not develop because from a younger age, they've got the tools to stop that. Is that right? Is that, or do you still find that maybe 100%. you talk, work with someone and then when they're older, these come back or is it more? Well, yeah, I, I, make, I, I, I totally agree with you. One of the reasons, so we do a lot of work in schools and, mm. uh, and one of the things that I absolutely love doing is exactly what you just talked about my belief system is is that if we could train po- what i call positive mental health not that there's a thing called like positive psychology i don't mean that and i also don't mean going in and saying to kids everything's fine children uh, <laughs> yeah. just smile and all your problems will go away yes mummy and daddy are getting a divorce and are fighting all the time but don't worry about it if we just think positive then you can be a, a, a great adult you know it's not mm-hmm. it's not like that um but, so i've just triggered about 20 percent of your listeners that oh my god remember when my mum and dad got divorced uh, that was terrible um, but, what i more mean by that is if we could just train them in understanding, as, as I call it, the mechanics of their mind, mm. if we can just show these kids that they're not broken, it doesn't matter how bad it gets, 
that their mm. mind isn't broken. They're, they're more likely stuck. And by the way, this applies to adults that are listening to this, which I imagine are going to be most of people who are listening. You, you're not broken, you're stuck. If you're someone who's going through anxiety attacks and anxiety, you're more than, your, your brain is stuck. Just so I had a, there was a boy in yesterday um, and uh, he's 13 years old. He's done three sessions and he's now, I mean, dad's like, I don't know what you've done, but it's just amazing. He's just feeling so much better. He was getting really anxious at night time. It's quite common around about that kind of 12, 13 age to, to all of a sudden start to recognize things like mortality uh, and the fact that people die and they don't come back and it, you, yeah. your kiddiness kind of disappears and all of a sudden you realize that you're in the race to becoming an adult. So mm -hmm. he was doing things like at 13 years old, wanting to sleep in with mum and dad again and all this type of stuff. Oh, okay, and all that yeah, yeah. in three sessions. Um, oh. and, um, and one of the things I said to him yesterday was, I was like, you know what the amazing thing about this wee man isn't the fact that you're feeling better. The amazing thing is that at 13, you've learned that therapy is not to be scared of. And uh, if anything happens, because, and this comes into your point, Mick, as you grow up and as you get to 15, 16, shit's going to happen. Somebody's going to break your heart. You're going to fail mm. an exam. You might not get into uh, the, the career that you want. It's not all going to go plain sailing. But now you know that when that bad stuff happens, that if you can't handle it yourself, that within one phone call to the right person, that you just need to come in and go, I've got shit in my head and I'm not feeling great. Can you sort that? And the right person will go, yeah, absolutely. No problem at all. Come on in. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, that, and it's like, a, it's almost like a dentist appointment. It becomes mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I've got a sore tooth. I need that fixed. I've got to admit more fun than the dentist, right enough. I've now compared <laughs> to the dentist. I you know, just see anybody listening, genuinely therapy can be more fun than the dentist. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like... It, it, it's about getting people at a young age to understand how their mind works and then all of a sudden you, you lift it. So I, I did a, a session last year, um, like before lockdown, it would have been about October time. Uh, and um, uh, which one was it? I think it was St. Andrews and St. Bride's in East Kilbride. Mm. And I got this message from my mum uh, after it saying um, my daughter's sixth year and she came home today and she said mum I learned today that I wasn't broken uh, oh, and, wow. burst into tears. and she said and and she said I just wanted to say thank you because I've been trying to tell my daughter that for the last three years wow. and she's came home today with some hope and that that is it I'm getting previous bumps telling that story uh, it's like it, it, it it's just that but oh, what we horrible. actually do instead is and this comes with adults as well. And we might have talked about this the last time because I can't quite remember everything that we spoke about. But when we teach people about mental health, what we do is we put our adult faces on, especially if it's kids. So what mm -hmm. we do is we frown and we lower our voices. So yeah, we have right? to speak about mental health. <laughs> and we're all here to speak about mental, mental health. health. And it gets really serious. <laughs> and it's like, right, children, you better be listening. Because now we're talking about mental health, and this is a very do you know people commit suicide? <laughs> and it's like, oh, God, yeah, they do, and we do have to acknowledge that we can't ignore it. But let's show them how it can get to that stage, so that they understand that they can avoid that, that it doesn't have to get there. Anyway, so no, it's a it's a great point. I, I am all for educating the youth um, uh -huh. of of today on on good mental health. Uh, it's, it's, it must be such a challenge that your industry faces because it's like everybody's so fine to go to the doctor, dentist, whatever, go and get yep. cosmetic surgery, go and get all these other things that are like literally slicing your body open. <laughs> but then just to talk about, oh, I had this thought today is like the scariest thing in the world. I'm like, I'd yep. rather talk about that all day than have someone scap you like my body wide open and take something <laughs> out of it. Do you know what I mean? I like, think there'd be plenty of people out there Greg, this is absolutely a quote for the website. This is how we're going to lead <laughs> on when you advertise this. I think there'd be many women out there that would be so comfortable in speaking about their new tits when they wouldn't necessarily be comfortable <laughs> about speaking about their anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> And they'd go, by the way, these, I got these done in Singapore uh, or somewhere like that. I don't know why Singapore. <laughs> yeah. I went to Turkey. Uh, you know, like guys, like genuinely, I have met guys that are happier to tell, the, tell you that they've had a hair transplant and show yeah. you their scar from their hair transplant and go like this to even admit for a second that they have a mental health problem. Yes. The people who talk about the rash that they've got, you know that one, <laughs> uh, and they'll go, oh, "I've had a rash. It's been it's, it's actually a bit smelly now." I've, oh, I've really oh, 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 
<laughs> rather um, than tell somebody that actually they've been feeling a bit flat and depressed and i see that that's what we change it's, 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 it's vulnerability but do you know what i mean and if it, it is, is if, it, totally. if it's something that has been so deep rooted in and in, in their childhood they'll probably still react to it in a childish manner you know rather than facing up to it do you know what i mean um exactly. and, and be able to go i i got that done because i was going a bit bald but don't talk to me about being or you know i <laughs> just talk to me about the fact that i get anxious when i go into social situations okay. you know no no i'm fine guys i'm fine and it mm. is it's it's I don't, I don't know how we get through that um because i know that there's loads of stuff now about removing the stigma and and that and that kind of thing but for me i think we talked about this last time greg but it it, it can it starts from the top and and i think when you've got guys i'm sure we did talk about this because it was like guys like the rock so when you get guys like Dwayne johnson coming out and speaking about their mental health yep and kind of but in a real positive way the challenge is is that a lot of people talk about it um, not necessarily all celebrities now, they tend to be a lot better, but a lot of people talk about it really negatively again. Like mm. I've had anxiety for years and I've been just struggling right through it, but I just keep on fighting and, and it's this kind of, that kind of chat is, I, I get it, you, you, you try to be open, but it's still that battle rather mm. than, by the way, I had anxiety for, a, for years, but I went for therapy and uh, it was great. Do you know what? I took tablets for a wee bit just to level the ship, but... Do you know what? I don't take them anymore and now I'm feeling much better and my life's moving on and it was just a period of my life. That mm. See if we could get more people of, in, in power telling those messages. And I don't know, you know, especially with my uh, football allegiances, I probably shouldn't be supporting this, but I've got to admit that Wills and Kate, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, Wills and Kate and even Prince Harry and Meghan and all of that, that youth of the royal family mm. uh, have been doing, I've just been, by the way, I've just had all my Celtic support and credentials uh, <laughs> removed. Uh, somewhere, uh, by the way, he supported the royals. Uh, <laughs> he's singing Real Britannia now. Uh, but genuinely, having, having people like that, like at that level, on that level of publicity, and I've got to admit, I think they come over as genuinely nice people. I, I know we could get into arguments about privilege and blah, 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 blah. But they come over as people who are, are making a difference. Yeah. And, mm. and, it's, and it's opening Peter Crouch, you know that thing that Prince William did recently with all the footballers? Yep, yep. Amazing. Yeah. That type of thing. Brilliant. That, that's what we need. We need more of that. But to, to talk about, and then I got better. And then things, rather than just leaving it on, yeah, mental health shit in it. Uh, like getting it to a point where it's mental health shit in it and it's amazing though when you get through it and it's yep. just that last little bit of the message that I think mm. would make people feel more hopeful yeah that exciting part is you know what I mean I feel like because it's definitely something that I've, I've uh, focused on a lot in my time and it's like um, there is that that exciting part I don't know why people don't share it but that yep. moment of totally. by the way do you know how good it feels when you actually just deal with that situation like it's brilliant Absolutely. The world loves a meltdown, but that's a problem. <laughs> that's uh, that is the thing, isn't it? It's like, I mean, I think we're all sitting at the moment, you know, as we record this, probably just waiting on Trump doing a proper meltdown. Oh, <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Aye. It's, coming. it's coming. It's, definitely it's coming. coming. See, just as a complete segue, by the way, this could take us off on a crazy tangent. Greg, we said we weren't going to do these, but just as a wee thing, okay. um, that if, if anybody, uh, that, that, how Trump has behaved pre-election and post-election for anybody who recognizes trump's behavior in their relationship um i promise you're in a controlling relationship and you need to look very very carefully at what's happening so somebody that basically tries to tell you and gaslights you by telling you there's no problem has a great big strop and uses silent treatment that that basically uses anger and uh, and frustration to try and control people um, that, that does all of these that he genuinely has shown so many of the traits of somebody who has, you know, stopped the count. I, did, I don't know if you saw this. There was a great thing. Um, I don't know if you watched that um, last week tonight with John Oliver. No, I don't know. Um, it's a great, it's on Sky Atlantic. He's like an English comedian, but he's based in America and he does kind of political kind of satire kind of comment. But he was showing you these clips that in one of the states, all the Trump supporters were going, stop the count, stop the count. And then he went, at exactly the same time here, where the, where the vote was, where Trump was in the lead, there was a whole big bunch of them with their Trump pen signs going, 
vote, uh, uh, count their votes, count their votes. So they're all <laughs> with Trump, they're all going, stop their count. Some and they stay across where, they're, where he's winning. They're like, keep counting votes. Yeah, you know, like it's, it's just mental. But anyway, uh, but uh, he he showed all the traits of controlling relationship. But yeah, we're waiting for him to have that big emotional meltdown because uh, because as you say, Greg, the world loves it, and, and that I think to a certain extent is where. You know the the you know we we chase now in terms of that whole cancel culture thing, which has been a big thing. You yeah. know, chase it, chase it, chase it until this person breaks. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you look at the likes of Caroline Flack. Do you know oh I mean? man, yeah. I mean, Oof. she was like her. I don't know, man. Her her whole scenario. I was quite sickened by the whole thing. She was, that was horrible. Uh, aye, she 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 was literally hounded to the point of uh, of breaking point. That's just just because you are. Uh, any form of celebrity, A list or Z list, do you know what I mean? As soon as you yeah. put yourself in the public eye, you're just you're painting a target in your back and once they smell blood, they're like sharks, Absolutely. do you know what I mean? One wee droplet, a weakness, bomb, and that's yeah, it, they're a, on you. It's a massive it's a massive cycle though, because we, this pressure gets put on celebrities or people that are in the public eye to be this perfection, to be this thing where they're not allowed to do wrong or have like mess ups or say the wrong thing or whatever. But then because we're putting that on these people and that's what we're seeing in the media, we then reflect that back in ourselves because then we, we might say the wrong thing and go, oh, I remember when such and such got hounded on social media for saying that. Now I must be a terrible person because I've messed up and slipped up here. Mm-hmm. Instead of allowing ourselves to just go, oh, wait, we are human. We're allowed to make that mistake. How do we move on from it? Do you know what I mean? I know, obviously, with people like Trump, it's a bit different because he's consistently doing and acting like that. So that's actually <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah. something he's dealt with. But there is situations in, in the, the media where we see celebrities that I'm like, I thought they were an all right guy. So that's probably just a slip up or just like he, he said it out of context. Or do you get what I mean? Like, yeah, is it totally? Like, I think you've got, Mexico. I think they've got a, uh, the, as long, I think there's a thing as well, though, that if you just own it right off the bat, Right, so you look at Russell Brand, drug addict, yep. sex addict, general just rogue <laughs> character. <laughs> uh, rogue, I like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he's come out and built that. Mercy streak, you guys. Yeah. Uh, that was a bit of a shagger, right? And then everyone goes, oh, you scamp. And then he's like, <laughs> but I've, I've changed my ways. So no matter what anyone ever comes out in the press and goes, I look what you did, and you go, I know. But I tell you, and it was ages but also ago. Also, look at look at the growth in him as a person. I know. Like, yep. like it's phenomenal. Exactly. Like the understanding. For those, for those of you that are listening to this podcast, by the way, Greg is currently sitting with his shirt unbuttoned right down to his waist, surrounded by incense sticks and candles, while he tries to <laughs> kind of be Russell Brand. That's what. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's what he's trying to be. <laughs> so, yeah. There are, there are think, similarities, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I mean, it, it's. It, 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 Mick, uh, Mick, if see when Mick is a dancer, see when your knees go, you've got another career as a kind of general sort of uh, like um, philosopher on mental health because you, you're echoing so much stuff that's absolutely stuff that I've been talking about for ages. <laughs> the cancel culture and, and how we oh, behave like that, that <laughs> is, is what we are teaching, especially again, we come back to kids because they're soaking it in. Um, so I see something wrong. I it, like the whole weight of the world is going to come down on me, and that thing about like I am, I am so happy. I, I was actually speaking to, to a couple of mates about this at the weekend. I am so happy that smartphones and uh, and social media was not about in the nineties when I was oh, I, going about and oh, bouncing about, you know, because some of the stuff that would have been posted probably would be that this man's being allowed in our schools. I found a picture of him at Resurrection <laughs> Event 2 dressed in a white boiler suit with 3D glasses on. Uh, and, uh, I had genuinely 3D glasses, two light sticks, my res hat, my gloves, my whistle. I went through two whistles that night because I broke the first one because for some reason I couldn't get <laughs> too hard. I broke my first whistle. Uh, uh, and stood there for like, I remember, oh amazing you know if that picture went about you know I, I'm sure I'd love to share it now probably but I think we get into to this place though where you know because somebody found a tweet from when this person was 17 you know a lot of the MPs that have been you know they must resign and it's like mm. geez oh is it not okay for somebody just to go right okay I'm, as, as Russell Brand managed to, to basically brash his oh, way through I, I would be also very very mm. interested it would be, I think, a very, very different world um, if Russell Brand was a woman. 
Uh, oh, aye, well. he'd have been vilified. Uh, if, if Russell Brand was a woman, mm. I don't think we'd let a woman away with with that anywhere near no. as much. In fact, if you look at somebody like Which Daniel, a shame. Like, uh, or somebody like that, Kerry Katona, <clears throat> you know, then mm, they'll be, oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, we go, yeah, Russell, yeah. rogue, you know, he's a boy, he's a lad, and I love God, his uh, he's a lad. Uh, but uh, it's a very different thing, I think, when you switch the gender around as well. Is that not just linked to the way that we see our gender roles historically? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's changing, which is lovely. I mean, it is changing. We've got a generation coming up that I don't think will see the world that way. You know, my, both my daughters are at uni just now. And even what Mick was saying about dancers, you know, I think everything's starting to go, do do you, you know, you do you, wh whatever mm. that is. You know, the, the fact is, I can mm. go into a school. This, to, if I went back and met 16-year-old me and told that me, what would that now be, you know, five or six years ago, like 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, now, if I went back, if I went back to 17-year-old me 30 years ago and told him what I was about to say, I think he'd go, nah, no chance. But basically, I can go into schools now, they're LGBTQ, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, societies are are out and proud, you know, they're there, they're advertised mm. around the school, there are people having gay relationships around the school, there are boys who go dancing and are absolutely delighted with it, you know, that, and to the point mm. where they'll stand in front of their school and they'll do a show because they want to show that this is what they do. There are, there are lassies now boxing and playing football and being proud of it and managing to make careers out of it. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, in a, we're in a pretty good place for all that. There's still a, a hell of a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. um, oh, but, it, but it is shifting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I can see it in like my daughter's generation. So that 20, so 21 and 19, and I can mm -hmm. kind of see it coming up that you can see the shift happening where it's just not accepted anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I, this is a lovely wee story. My, my therapy room um, has a... a um, I, I like to call it superhero rooms. So basically, all my posters and pictures are various superheroes, you know, and because uh, I want to kind of give that metaphor of this is where you are. And about, uh, I think it was about nine months ago. So in fact, no, it wasn't this year. In fact, that's how quickly this year. So it was sometime last year, just at the end of last year, there was a wee lassie, she was about 10 years old, came in. And I always use this as an introduction of, look, this is the superhero room. And, you know, we've got all our superheroes up. And she just looked up at my walls and she was like, ah, you've got no girls. Uh, uh, and she noticed wow. that I had no, I had no girls uh, up on my wall. I had Spider Man and Batman and Star uh, Wars and Back to the Future and all of this type of stuff. I thought I was being really clever, uh, but she spotted at ten years old. She's like, ah, "You've got no girls up there." Uh, whereas I think, even ten years ago, she probably wouldn't have even noticed. She probably yeah. would have been, fair dues. You know, this is a superhero room. They're all boys. You know, like so, uh, it's, uh, and also, I don't know if you guys have been caught on this one yet. I've, I'm now trained. I've, I'm pretty much. I think I'm about ninety percent trained out of this. But the the whole thing about stopping calling grown women girls all the time. Oh, I get it. Uh, but where, you I know, just... the, the girl in the office. You know, the, the uh, last thing that'd be last in the so office. But it's like no, the women in the office. Yeah, uh, you know that type of thing has been coming up. But that changes perception. That changes how we think about things. And uh, and the more we do that, the more it changes everything else. And we actually start to see, you know, young women as young women rather than real asses and mm -hmm. and young men. You know, it's young men and these real asses. No, it's yeah. young men and it's young women. And, and yeah, that's, that's so true. But, actually, it's a concept I've never even thought about. I think I do actively try, actually, to do that. Like, me and my, me and my partner do actively try and say exactly yeah. what I just said. We wouldn't be, I wouldn't be like, oh, my girlfriend's coming with me. I'd be like, my partner or my lady's coming with yeah. me. Do you get what yeah. I mean? Because it just Absolutely. feels, I do feel like I'm belittling her if I'm like, oh, my girl's there, do you know what I mean? Or, like, my girlfriend's coming because it makes it, it's like, what, your daughter or your life partner? Like, what is it? But the thing I mean? is, straight enough, mate, you have to be careful because sometimes getting called a woman makes them feel dead old. So they, they always yeah. say, oh, <laughs> I'm no Can't it win? Can't it Can't it You know, like, uh, yeah, but I think, but yeah, it is, it's, it's very true. And, and it's something now when I go into school and you can actually see, you can see the change it makes in, in, the, in the, the young woman as well. Like when you go into somebody who's even fourth year and you go, I know a young woman like you, you actually, you, you give them some agency, you give them some, some that, that that's the, the wee subtle mental health changes that we can make, you know, these mm. tiny little differences that are almost imperceptible, but they make massive shifts in how someone perceives themselves. And I suppose that comes back to the self-esteem thing. 
Yeah. You know, like, I, uh, do you know it's funny? I had a I had an experience with in uh, Slaters in Glasgow when I was seventeen, and uh, I went in to get I was getting measured up for a suit. I was going uh, I can't remember what I was doing, but I was going to get measured up for a suit. And you know how when they you put the suit on and then they get it all measured to fit you in there, yep. and then you've got to go back and pick it up. So I made with a couple of Tesco bags for life, right? Just filled my <laughs> messages, and uh, I was sitting there waiting, just a wee guy, and the guy was called me. Um, oh, if you want to come over here and get your suit, Mr. Chalmers. And he called me Mr. <laughs> and then suddenly I was like, indeed. <laughs> Mr. <Mister laughs> Chalmers. <laughs> I have arrived. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really stuck with me in this day. I still remember it. It was almost like the turning Mr. point for Charles. being just a, being a wee guy to being Mr. Charles. Exactly. I remember, <laughs> going to, I remember going to the football once and a, and a guy calling me big man because I'm six foot two and a guy like walking past me and going, excuse me, big man, can I watch some more? And me going, big man? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big man. Oh, Check I'm big me. Man. I, yeah, I'm not a wee guy like you anymore. Uh, but it is, it's, it's, it's totally true. I love that. And, and Slater's is a good example of it because Slater's still has a bit of a separation, not quite as much. You know, you go and you get your suit and then they take you to the lassies with the shirts you know, and, they, and they hand you over <laughs> to yeah. the lassies with the shirts. And I think they even describe them as that. I might go into Slater's and just have a wee try and just, you know, just to see if they, how they describe them. An expose. Yeah, to, just to see. Because it is, all the, all the, it's all lassies that do the shirts. I used to work at McDonald's years ago. And that, even in there, you know, and that was when I was, what, 20, I was about 20, 21 sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was all the, bo all the boys in the kitchen, all the lassies out in the front counter. So all the lassies nice. would do the tills, all the boys in the kitchen. It's kind and of the, the same way car garages. Like, car, if you go and get a car, it seems yeah. to be like that as well. Eh? You go, it's all like the car salesman. And then yeah. you get the lassie on the desk, it'll write you up. Aye, aye absolutely. That's so true, aye. The only place I've ever seen that, that that's massively different uh, is uh, when you start going into certain cars of a yeah. of a certain level. Mm -hmm. uh, like you go to Audi, for instance, uh, in Glasgow, and and uh, all of a sudden you're like, because uh, because they, they know that if they flirt with you, <laughs> you probably are going to go no, for the buying. four rather than the A3, <laughs> uh, uh, and they can yeah. talk you into the black edition. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, they, you know they, they they get that. But um, yeah, I mean, whole, yeah, I'll let you drive me home in this. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brian. So I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, obviously, there's a vaccine for COVID and all that. Yep. And people, I think, are feeling a bit uncertain, a bit unsure about what the hell's going on. And that obviously raises some form of anxiety within people, right? Um, and uh, you had mentioned to me off camera about this kind of under 25 age group in particular. Yep. So um, what, what what is going on? <laughs> what is going on? What is going on? Well, I've got my finger in the pulse, uh, Greg. I've been speaking to Boris and Nicola. And it, no, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I think from a mental health perspective, we're in a, a really um, we're in a really funny place. Uh, the, the analogy that I'm going to bring, I know not everybody will get this completely, but it's the best one I can think of. Is <clears throat> it is like a footballer getting their head turned. Um. It's like, you know, there you are playing for what seems to be a really good team, but then an even bigger team come along and say, oh, we're interested, and then it falls through. And now you're left at Kilmarnock and a freezing... <coughs> oh, Kilmarnock are obviously a good team, I'm sure, uh, and have many good things uh, going for them, so I'm not saying they're like a diddy team, so that's not what I'm saying at all. But you're <laughs> ending up uh, in Kilmarnock on a Wednesday night, freezing cold, when three weeks before Monaco were fluttering their eyelashes at you, and now the question is, is how do you get yourself back up? So I think from a mental health perspective, one of the things that everybody's been waiting for is hope. And then all of a sudden we're getting all these vaccine announcements. And then as of the time of recording this, we are two days before kind of Central Belt Scotland going back into lockdown. And then all of a sudden they're locking us back down again, just as we thought that, but you said that there was, we, 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 but I heard that my gran was going to get it before Christmas. And now you're saying that I have to stay back in my house. And it's just this, it's like, here's the light at the end of the tunnel. By the way, it's further away than you think. Mm. Uh, and this is, it, classic stuff for um, uh, causing people to be depressed. Uh, it can cause all sorts of anxiety because people start to go, oh, I'm out of it. And then you go, no, you're not. Uh, mm. And that can then start to go, but I really want out of it because they started to allow their mind, you know, as we said right at the start, inside out process. So mm. the mind starts to shift and go, right, that's it, we're coming out. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, you can't go to the shops. You can't go and visit your mum. You can't see your pals. Your Christmas night out's cancelled. 
Mm-hmm. And especially at this time of year when it's normally a year when lots of good things are happening. So, you know, when I'm speaking to young people, I was speaking to a young guy yesterday uh, and he's, he lives up north and his mum's pure on him. His mum's texting me going, ah, he's not doing anything to get a, get a job. And God love him, he is. He really is trying. He told me all the applications he's done. And there's just, as, as Mick, as you said earlier about, you know, dancing with Justin Timberlake, you know, that's now mm. a job in boots. You know, uh, a job in Boots now has, what, you know, 2,000 applications uh, for, mm. you know, two part-time vacancies because there's so many people out of work. I'd, I've got, you know, in Glasgow, um, where I am, uh, one of my old workplaces is now shut. And uh, and I think there's more following suit, which is the Hilton Hotel, um, just at the end, just by the Kingston Bridge. So mm. I've already had contact from two of those people saying I'm thinking about reskilling because I've been made redundant. Uh, you know, so there's, there's just this flood of people into the market. So for young people who are unskilled, mm-hmm. they're just looking going, what am I meant to do? You know, my mm-hmm. daughter, my 19-year-old daughter showed me her folder of rejections the other day of, of emails of stuff that she sent to jobs. And there was about 40 odd of them. Mm-hmm. And only some of them are getting back to her. And I think that's that's where we are at the moment. The the thing that we have to get, and, and we may have spoken about this last last time is, is that we have to start getting into long-term thinking and that pulls us back into that weight loss thing. The way to lose your three stone is to think long-term. And by long-term, by the way, I'm talking summer. Uh, And if everything goes well, my wife's a microbiologist. She thinks it's all a bit quick, uh, to be honest, at the moment, because as Mm -hmm. she said, a clinical trial will normally be three years. Uh, Um, So technically speaking, what they're about to do is a live clinical trial. Um, you know, uh, to, to a certain extent, um, not in a not in a super scary way because they have tested it. And, and as as I said to her, I'm like, yeah, but it's never had a thing where the whole world has been working on one thing. Yeah. But if we can just start to get the hope that maybe, like, by May, April, you know, if by April or May, if we could have um, all of the sort of like 70s and above if most of them could be vaccinated then there's a chance that some of normal life can start to get back Mm -hmm. you know and then we just keep the rollout going so the the reason i'm talking about that so specifically is is because there's 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 problems fall into three categories Uh, hopeless helpless and worthless Uh, worthless we spoke about right at the beginning i'm not good enough helpless to a certain extent, it's been a wee bit here in lockdown, uh, but not massively because we know that people are working on it and people are trying stuff. So we know that we, it's just as when, but the thing that it was really affecting was that hopeless thing. And hopelessness mm-hmm. sits at the bottom of depression. So that feeling of hopelessness, there's no hope, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. I'm never getting out of this. It's where a lot of people are at the moment. They're losing jobs, they've got no money. Things that there's no, the, the, if you lose your job, where's the next job? The only thing I can see that to give people a bit of hope i was actually i was walking through glasgow yesterday and i was listening to i I caught a tiny wee bit of two taxi drivers outside central Central station talking about hey but this is pure shite and what's going to happen this place is going to go dead again and it was about that that i heard just as i walked Mm -hmm. past but the simple fact is is that there is a time coming when we're going to need taxi drivers again there is a time Mm -hmm. coming when we're all going to want to go to restaurants there is a time when we're going to want shops there is a time so even though they're shutting just now we will get back. It will come back because we'll all want the same stuff. As soon as yeah. lockdown finishes, we want all our pilots back flying planes because mm. uh, even though the, the planets had a bit of a breather, <laughs> yeah, we're all like, fuck this, I'm going to Magaluf. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> where are you going? Like, where is this flight going? I don't give a shit. Is it sunny? <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm going. Uh, I mean, like, if, if they release, I mean, summer next year could just be carnage, you know, if, it, if it's in any way open. You know, it's mm. because everybody's, I think, just going to want to, to run, but everybody's also going to want to go out. So, but the hope's long term. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily help you when you're sitting here just now and you just lost your job and you've got no money. Mm. And it's that, it's about, it's, it's easy for me to sit and go, oh yeah, you've got to think long term, guys. But that comes into that positive thinking thing again. Mm-hmm. But mm. ultimately, there's a little bit where you've not got any choice. It's about treading water, accept it. It's, it's you might have to tread water, but that's, it's that's the thing, isn't it? Sorry, yeah, sorry, for you, Mick. I mean, you're in you're in creative industries, mm-hmm. uh, you know. So you know, you guys must have found apart from your teaching, 
you know, a whole heap of work. I, I, just as a wee aside, sorry, Mick, before that, is I was watching the one show last night. I was expecting to go onto my Facebook and just see all of the creative people, all the singers and all that go mental because they actually ran a thing about a, a, Dolly, a Dolly Parton tribute act and mm -hmm. her going uh, to somebody and going, well, what could I do? Because I've got no transferable skills. And her going, well, you could be a PA or you could do this or you could oh. do that. And I'm like, that is so patronizing oh, to the yeah. fact of this woman has built this career. She had this business, mm -hmm. but it's okay. You can be a PA. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, you've got skills of organizing people. So maybe that's what, and I know that any port in a storm, but there was something about it that just basically went, you know what? <laughs> Well done, singing hen. You just give that up now and just go and get a proper <laughs> job, you know. And yeah, I, Mick, you must be feeling this. that massively through. Uh, the well, I don't know if you've seen. Did you see the advertisements that were brought out and they were uh, sponsored the by the Alley government? Yeah, uh, that kicked up. So I think people are just tired of hearing it now because it's just a consistent thing. But yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I just to be honest, I just don't focus on it because I know that I have a worth in what I do, and I know that whatever it is, I will find, like like what you said, if it's through teaching for now, then I'm just going to find where I can fit into that and make as much of that as a thing as I can. Like, I do a lot on Zoom and I do a lot on that sort of thing because, I mean, I could sit here and dwell on the fact that I'm not on stage at the moment and I'm not doing that, but at the end of the day, it's out with my control. I can't, yeah. I can't sit and go, oh, okay, well, I'm not on stage, so I'll sit here and sulk about it because that will make it happen. It's, it's not going to change it, is it? So... I may as well just try and keep keep training. Like uh, it's what you're saying, and it? it's like it's trying to be positive without going. Oh, I'll just put a smile on my face. That's yeah. that that doesn't fix the issue. I'm just mm -hmm. going to be positive in the sense of okay, where can I dance? Where can I use what I do? Yep. Where can I keep the, these things going? You know, That's I think it, it's uh, my missus is having a massive time with it now because she's actually from Australia, so she came over here to perform in London. She, she, she hit the ground running, had an amazing start to London, started booking really big jobs, then COVID hit, and her, <laughs> and her, visa, her visa finishes in June. <laughs> so she's literally wow. like, she's just looking at the world like, are you kidding me on? <laughs> like, Hi, exactly. You you'd, hope I mean? though that, you'd hope that somebody would be adult about that and go, okay, we'll, we'll extend your visa because you didn't get the proper shot right. at it, but then, and computer says no, yeah, yeah government is that, is that kind of favourite thing, people. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, will they think like that? The government's uh, answer to it is, oh, we would we would extend your visa if it ran out during the first lockdown, so between March and uh, June, I think it is. Okay. And I'm like, aye, but they had already had their two years, they people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, what about the people that? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Ah, uh, wow. That's a different story. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Right, gentlemen, well, I am going to uh, call it a day. I know, Brian, you're a very busy man. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, thanks very much for coming on and talking to us An again. I really pleasure. appreciate it. Um, it's been a, a pleasure. It's been great. Uh, it um, our our, our three-way worked well. Uh, really I wasn't did. expecting this before I came on, but it was, it was brilliant. So thank mm. you to you guys because... Uh, yeah, I, I think it's such an important message to get out there and, and it's great to hear that there's other people as well out there that are that are talking, especially to young people, like you said, Mick, that are talking to young people out there about the, the, the right ways to run their mind. And mm. I think for the, for the adults, you know, again, therapy, as we said, is not to be scared of. And, and I think set your sights long term. We'll, mm. we'll have an all right summer. <laughs> hopefully we'll be back in the football stadiums well depending know, on how please. results go maybe I might not want to be back in the football stadiums but depending mm. on how the football stadiums go I'm, I'm, I've got it in my head that I will use my season ticket at least once this season <laughs> to uh, see Celtic it's the most expensive see, one ticket. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But sorry, right. they're not going to win ten anyway. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> but and if we do, we're going to stumble over the line like uh, some sort of like, oh, tired man. triathlon runner that gets <laughs> carried across. You know, carried oh. across by somebody like Saint Mirren who beats yeah. Rangers like one 0 in the last day of the season. And, <laughs> <laughs> you say, like, are you all right now? Are you okay? <laughs> you just go and rest there and we'll have a that. Yeah, that's another, that could be a whole other one, the psychology yeah. of football management. Um, yeah. and, uh, what happens when you don't tell people what, like, how to play the game? Just go <laughs> out and play like sure it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> right okay so I'm going to sign off just now okay so uh, thanks very much for listening folks please hit those like and subscribe buttons